Huddled under a submerged rock, this tiny architect gets to work building its masterpiece. Weaving together stones and shells with delicate silk, the caddisfly is both a mason and an artist. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. So today we're talking about the order Trichoptera, better known as the caddisflies. Now you might be thinking that these caddisflies look a lot like a butterfly or a moth. To which I would reply, that's because butterflies and moths are close relatives of the caddisflies. To which you would feel validated. So good job. So when you're identifying a caddisfly, you're most likely to get it confused with some sort of lepidopteran. Now, caddisflies hold their wings like a tent over their body, not spread. So that eliminates a lot of moths from the get-go. Caddisflies also have filiform antennae. So if it has complex plumose antennae, that's probably also a moth. Okay, pause. I just wanted to make a clarification here that moths are not limited to just plumose antennae. In fact, many moths also have filiform antennae. So the presence of filiform antennae does not necessarily confirm an insect as a caddisfly, but rather the presence of a complex plumose antennae confirms that it is not a caddisfly. Okay, unpause. They also lack those siphoning mouth parts that a lot of Lepidopterans have. Instead, most caddisfly mouth parts are non-functional, although you will see them often have these long maxillary palps, so don't get them confused. But the most tried and true way to tell a caddisfly from a moth lies in their wings. Butterflies and moths are known to have wings that are coated in fine scales. Caddisflies, on the other hand, have wings that are coated in hairs, or as we call it in the insect world, seedy. These cetaceous wings are actually where caddisflies get their name. Trichos means hair in Greek, and pteron means wing. So trichoptera means hairy winged. Caddisflies are holometabolous, meaning they have a complete four-stage metamorphosis from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. Caddisflies lay masses of jelly-like eggs on vegetation or rocks right by the water. Or in some case, they'll even dive down and lay their eggs under the surface. Females can produce hundreds of eggs, and after just a few weeks, the larvae are ready to hatch. As you might have guessed by now, caddisfly larvae are fully aquatic. Trichopter and larvae are famous for the crazy contraptions that they build under the water. Some caddisfly larvae will build little protective cases that they carry around with them like a hermit crab shell. They use silk to weave together underwater debris to create this cozy abode. Others still will create nets or domes of silk that not only provide shelter, but also entrap debris or even small invertebrates for food. And some are free living and just walk around. Not everyone in the family can be artistically gifted. But let's talk about what caddisfly larvae look like underneath all these flashy constructs. Caddisfly larvae look sort of like caterpillars, but perhaps a little less cute. I think they're both pretty cute, but nobody asked, so. Their heads and thorax are fairly hardened or sclerotized, while their abdomen is soft and squishy. They're gonna have tube-shaped bodies, three pairs of gangly thoracic legs, and chewing mouth parts. It's also gonna have a pair of small, squishy abdominal prolegs all the way toward the back of the abdomen, which sounds really cute. Uh, what makes it less cute, however, is these are equipped with what we call an anal claw. It uses these to fasten itself to its little shelters. Caddisflies are primarily going to use cuticular respiration, where gas exchange occurs directly through the skin. However, a lot of them are also going to have abdominal gills to help with the uptake of oxygen. Larvae with cases will often wriggle around in their case to keep the water flowing and the oxygen diffusing. Caddisfly larvae will feed and grow for around a year, sometimes more, and they're not really picky eaters. Some scrape algae or sunken leaves, some feed on detritus, and others will eat anything smaller than itself. Once fully grown, caddisflies will spin a silken cocoon under the water where it will pupate for around a month or so. It will then cut through its pupil case and emerge from the water surface as a fully developed adult. 
They don't really eat as adults, so all their focus is on reproduction. Like mayflies, many species of caddisfly will sync up their emergence for safety in numbers while they mate and lay eggs. Many caddisflies will use pheromones to find one another, with the male following the scent of the female. They may mate landed or on the wing, but once the deed is done, the female finds a cozy spot for her gelatinous eggs and the cycle starts all over again. Caddisflies and humans rarely come into any sort of conflict. The swarms can get annoying if you're someone who's lost the magical wonder of nature that they once held as a child, uh, but besides that, there's really only positives. Okay, there may be like one or two species that nibble on rice patties and any other aquatic plants, uh, but those are the exception and they're really not even that impactful. Caddisflies have a great deal of benefit for us humans and the environment as a whole. For one, they're great food sources for our fish. Fly fishers know this, and you can find a whole host of flies with different patterns to mimic different groups of caddisflies, or caddis as they call them. Also, caddisflies are great indicators of water quality. We commonly use the diversity and abundance of aquatic invertebrates to quantify the health of an aquatic system, and three orders stand out in particular. We refer to these three orders as EPT, the Ephemeroptera, the Plecoptera, and the Trichoptera. These three orders are very pollution intolerant, so if you're seeing good diversity and abundance of these groups, it's probably some pretty good water. Since they are pollution intolerant, it's critical that we keep our waterways clean to keep our caddisflies in good number. Try to limit chemical application on your property, especially if you live near water. Additionally, planting native plants around waterways can help filter pollutants before they reach the water. This also will help with temperature regulation through shading, and even help stabilize the soil so loose sediments don't muddy the waterways. Caddisflies are also known to be drawn to lights, so try to remember to turn off your outdoor lights when not in use. Finally, I mentioned this in the stonefly episode, but try to avoid creating these rock stacks. When you remove a rock from the water, you're removing critical shelter and habitat for a whole host of organisms, including caddisflies. But as always, so long as you put the rock back where you found it, I'm all for picking up stones in search of cool bugs. I think that's just about all I have to say on the caddisflies. So thank you all for listening, and if you like the content, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future orders. And if you have any favorite species from this group, or just any fun Trichopter facts I didn't mention, please leave them in the comments below, I would love to hear about them. Peace y'all.